With Shaken Bacons, it is finally time to revisit the Attack of the Clones. I'm not gonna lie, I kind of put off doing this review. I procrastinated just a wee bit because it is out of all of the other Star Wars films and the prequels. It's kind of, it's a little middle of the road. It's kind of mediocre. It doesn't inspire a lot of passion in me one way or the other. So I kind of procrastinated and put off doing this revisit review, but the time has come. I'm getting it out of the way and then we can move on to bigger and better Star Wars movies like Revenge of the Sith will be next. So let's do it. Prior to The Last Jedi, this movie was my least favorite out of every other Star Wars film. My least favorite. Except the Christmas special, but I don't really count that and I don't think it really counts because wow. Now, I feel like I should reiterate in case somebody missed this in any of my prior Star Wars reviews, I just want to say I like the prequels. There are people that absolutely, absolutely hate them. I grew up on Star Wars getting introduced to the prequels by my dad. I have a deep, enduring fondness for the prequels in my heart. I like the prequels. I don't hate them. Out of the prequels, however, I think that this film is the... I mean, let's not sugarcoat it. I think it's the worst out of the prequels. I still watched this movie so much when I was younger, and we had it on VHS. So I watched this movie so many times on VHS that I actually wore blue spots into the film. Did you ever do that to a VHS? Did you even have VHS? My parents had VHS way after DVDs came out because they insisted DVDs were going to be a fad. <laughs> so we were the people that kept buying VHS for like five years or so after DVDs started gaining traction. So I wore straight up blue holes in the footage of our VHS copy of Attack of the Clones. And I also wore, I think the only other movie I wore blue holes into the footage of was The Fellowship of the Rings from Lord of the Rings. Those two movies, I wore blue holes into the footage. For those of you who somehow don't know, and I can't imagine that you wouldn't know because why would you be watching this if you didn't know this, but Tag of the Clones was written and directed by George Lucas. And I think that George Lucas's strong suit is conceptualizing and it's not directing, which is something I think most people probably know and acknowledge by now. But I feel like I shouldn't have to say this since this movie is 17 years old now at the time I'm filming this review. Um, but spoilers? Scooch if you don't want to be spoiled. You best scooch along. Or at this point, <laughs> you probably should have seen this movie. This Star Wars episode brings us Anakin as like a quasi-adult. He's in his Padawan apprentice stage with Obi-Wan, and he's more seasoned when it comes to combat. He's grown up, he's started training, he's understanding the Force, may not entirely be understanding his role among the Jedi. Obi-Wan and Anakin are assigned to guard Senator Padme Amidala when there are several assassination attempts on her life, and one of them gets way too close. And this, of course, fans the flame of Anakin's passion for her. And they foil a second assassination attempt that leads Obi-Wan on a quest and a mission to discover who done it. And while Obi-Wan is off finding out who done it, Padmakin goes off to Naboo to hide slash fall in very awkward love. Along the way, on both sides, they discover the existence of the clones and of the droid army and continued development of the Separatists and their goals. Anakin slaughters not just the men, but the women. And the children too. There's a huge battle in an arena, many Jedi are lost, and yada yada yada. Padma King gets married at the end. Palpatine gets his emergency powers that start the slippery slope toward the formation of the Empire, and the Clone Wars have begun. Now, having seen Attack of the Clones so many times, I, I basically knew what I was getting into when I sat down to rewatch this. Like all of the prequels, this movie has some really high points for me, but it's also got some really low points. There are moments where Attack of the Clones really, really shines. And there are moments where it is incredibly impressive, such as when it introduces new worlds, new aliens, new characters, new creatures. A lot of its battle and action scenes are very, very engaging and fun to watch. But there, there are moments where this movie just plain sucks. There's no other way to put it. You can't pretend that it doesn't. 
as in anything with Padmakin where it isn't them fighting in an arena against a droid army. My opinion is that this is a terrible romance. I've never understood it. It doesn't make sense to me. I just, I loathe the relationship between Anakin and Padme for where it evolved. I, I don't get it. And why? Because it's so horribly awkward and horribly written. I don't care about their age difference, although frankly, I find it weird that she met him when he was that young and was still able to be like, mm. Personally, like, I don't think I would ever be able to get child Anakin out of my head. I would never be able to get around that. It's just way too bizarre to me. The other issue I have with their romance is that it's just so terribly written. The two of them deliver some of the worst lines in romantic cinematic history that I have personally seen. The thought of not being with you. I can't breathe. <laughs> I'm haunted by the kiss that you should never have given me. My heart is beating! But aside from the swaths of the film that were devoted to the developing feelings between Padmican, I really enjoy Attack of the Clones. This is the film where we start to see all of the politicking that was established in The Phantom Menace start to kind of flesh itself out. And it also starts to make more sense as the situation starts to disintegrate. It gives us a new view of the Jedi that's a very valuable one, I think, in both understanding how and why Anakin fell, how not just the Republic fell, but how the Jedi as an order also fell. This is the film where you're seeing for the first time not only the mechanics of the Republic and what was miring it down, but you're also seeing the mechanics of the Jedi, whose inner workings and who their own version of politics created a situation that led to their downfall. One of the major reasons Palpatine was able to convince the Senate and the people that the Jedi were so dangerous was because they're so secretive. I, I'm aware that I'm slightly jumping forward a movie here, but you really do start to see in this one how the Jedi are perceived and how they kind of cultivate that perception of them. And that is really what exacerbates the issue. So, for example, when Anakin and Obi-Wan go to chase down Sam Wessel, who's the assassin hired by Jango Fett, you see how the people react to them. They're demonstrating in the bar very obvious fear and distrust. Well, except for a sleaze bag and oh, but we all know he's on them death sticks. So that's probably a moot point, because that boy was high as... But Anakin says, Jedi business back to your drinks and everyone just like backs down and then avoids them like the plague man don't want to get near it don't want to touch it i'm not involved don't even look at me these people are terrified of the jedi and the jedi either don't notice or in keeping their secrets they allow that perception to just perpetuate and it's a very clear well executed way of highlighting the difference between the Jedi and how they're perceived by the normies because they're sort of operating almost like an elite mystical police force. And it scared people and Palpatine was able to turn this fear against them and use it to help him take control of the Republic. And you start to really see that groundwork in this movie and then it kind of blows up of course in Revenge of the Sith but there's a lot of really good groundwork in this film by George Lucas to illustrate that point. It's interesting that the Jedi were so secure in thinking that their position was impregnable, both morally and politically. They came kind of complacent and they allowed their complacency to let them brush off things that probably normally would have concerned them, like the behaviors Anakin started displaying or the questions he was asking or what was actually going on around them. And I think one of the best lines in the entire series comes from this movie, and it's from Mr. Dexter Jetster, which as a side note, I still don't get who he is or how we're expected to know how he knew Obi-Wan. And as far as I know, it's never really explained well. Like, and how are we supposed to believe that they're best pals? Like, I don't, and Obi-Wan acts like a little teenage girl. He's like, hello, Dick. <laughs> anyway, the best line I think comes from Dex, and of course, I think you guys all know which one I'm going to be saying. I should think that you Jedi would have more respect for the difference between knowledge and... <laughs> Wisdom. 
I mean, that really sums it all up. That sums up in a nutshell what the problem is with the Jedi in this era. So this film does a very good job of explaining the politicking and the Phantom Menace, laying the groundwork for us being able to understand how and why both the Republic and the Jedi fell. And the other area I think that it shines are the action and fight sequences. This film does them so, so well. The Kaminoans with the clone army discovery by Obi-Wan has probably one of my favorite scenes in this movie. It combines not only the skilled acting of Ewan McGregor, but it also combines the shock of the discovery of the army itself combined with intense action when Obi-Wan faces not just Jango Fett, but Boba Fett, who is fairly resourceful even as a child when it comes to attacks. I mean, for God's sakes, Obi-Wan not only stood off against Jango Fett with a rocket launcher, but Boba Fett in a gunship, gunning him down with ship cannons. That's crazy, and I love that action sequence. And this this might be kind of doofy, but the Kamino level is also like my favorite level in LEGO Star Wars. I just think it's really well done, not only in terms of the pacing, the interactions in that scene, the discovery of the army, but even in just the crafting of the world and of the Kamino and people, and I just think everything about that scene is great. It's like one of my favorite scenes. The other action scene that I really like that I know some people have a problem with is of course the Jedi fight in the arena. Although it does have its flaws, like I admit, how did the Geonosians not notice all of those Jedi all the way around the arena? How did they not notice that? You'd think that even if there's something happening in the arena, if there are beasts and a fight going on, if there was a random person or a different alien appearing next to you very obviously out of place as an outsider, you'd think that would tip you off. You'd think there would be enough of them that even at that point, like a Jedi mind trick probably wouldn't be enough to divert all of the Geonosians' attention. That I have never understood. But whatever. It is still a very fun action sequence. It's so cool to see them all charging into battle together, seeing them fight against the droids that come out. And I absolutely love the sequence just before that too, when Anakin and Obi-Wan and Padme are going up against those animals as they are on the block for execution. It's just such a cool display of the creatures and the aliens that exist in this universe that Luke is created, I just very much so enjoy it despite its flaws. Another fight that I love, that a lot of other people don't love, <laughs> is Yoda versus Dooku at the end of the scene. First of all, I love it because Anakin gets wrecked! And I love when Anakin gets wrecked because I don't really like Anakin as a character. I'm just gonna say it, I don't like Anakin. I like Darth Vader as a character, Anakin I'm not a fan of, I don't like his portrayal, I don't like his characterization. It's just not believable for me. I liked seeing him get wrecked, and then right after that, I loved watching Yoda swear off against his former apprentice, Dooku. From what I've gathered, people have an issue with the fact that Yoda was kind of... He was flipping a lot and doing that kind of a lightsaber fight. But, dude, I was pumped when I first saw this, and I saw Yoda throw down his cane. He just transforms from this small, crippled-seeming little alien to this whirlwind of death, you, like, and using the environment in such an intelligent way to give himself the height and the angles that he needed to go up against foes which were almost always way bigger than himself. I just think it's so cool to watch him face off against Dooku in this fight and actually see Yoda in action and you get to understand why Yoda is so fearsome despite having such a small stature. But, I mean, not... Not all the action in this movie is that great. I don't like the beginning chase where they're trying to chase down the assassin after the attempt was made on Padme's life. It's just kind of over dramatic to me. It never really sat well with me the way that it was paced. I'm just not a huge fan of that sequence. I also very strongly dislike the Geonosian factory fight scene. Anakin's skill in that fight scene seems to vacillate between almost an expert and then comically terrible. This was probably done on purpose to highlight his fluctuations and his conflict with the Force as he was alternating between strong emotions and trying to control himself. But all the same, I, I can't help but feel that that scene and that sequence is just horrendous. It keeps chopping back and forth between Padme being useless in a bucket to C-3PO getting knocked over for no apparent reason. It's all just a very contrived 
It just kind of looks like a very lackluster side-scrolling video game, which is quite frankly boring to watch. And on top of that, the music for that sequence is also not great. That all contributes to the fact that this fight scene is just bleh. That's never something you want to say uh, about an action sequence. It's just not. That also leads to a problem I have with the story in addition to what I've also been discussing. It's not only Anakin's character that's kind of back and forth in this movie, although if I'm being generous, like I said, it's not just his fighting style, but it's probably Lucas attempting to show the wax and wane of his emotions. I kind of see that argument, but it's not just his character that seems off. It felt like Lucas was of two minds about where he wanted to take the character of Padme in this movie. It's obvious, like we've all heard, I think he had different plans for her in Revenge of the Sith, but it's kind of obvious that it was this movie. He was going back and forth with what he wanted to do with her. Her character is, at many points in this film, greatly diminished in comparison to who she was throughout the entirety of The Phantom Menace. And in other moments, she is that person from The Phantom Menace. It just seems it's very back and forth in this film. You know, she goes from being a hopeless, breathless little girl with Anakin or during the assassination attempt where she just kind of lounges helplessly and poutily turns off the cameras in her apartment to being completely back to form with how she's portrayed in The Phantom Menace. Like when she decides herself to go after Obi-Wan, when she gets on top of things, when she's fighting the beasts in the arena before Anakin has even really reacted to what's happening. And in that scene, her character is so on point. I mean, honestly, it just seems like Anakin is just desperate trying to keep up with her and that's during the entire fight like not just the beast but even when they're fighting the droids if you watch it Anakin's honestly just trying to keep up with her and that's very true to who her character was established in the Phantom Menace and then you have moments like where it's just off like I mentioned before even at the end after the fight with Dooku you know, the whole movie they've been worrying about the propriety of what they're doing and keeping things a secret, and she just runs up to him in front of Yoda and Obi-Wan and just basically jumps his bones like it's nothing? And that doesn't make sense to me. You mean to tell me they didn't notice that was happening or think, hmm, that's weird. She would do that despite set up with her trying to deny her feelings and keep it a secret. I just, mm. And you mean to tell me that Goody Two Shoes Padme would just hear Anakin confess? But the women and the children too? And go, just go embrace him like, oh my dude, you're okay now, right? I'm here for you. Hell no. Hell no. Padme would not have done that in the previous movie. That would be a slowly back away. I'm gonna call Obi-Wan right now. That's whole scale murder of an entire village you just did. Padme is very much about the law and about the justice. Typically, her reaction would have been like, I gotta call somebody to deal with this because peace, I'm out, brother, you insane. No, it doesn't, it just doesn't jive with me. The acting overall, in addition to the story guy, that this film has is just kind of, well, it's not that great from mostly two people. And I know you guys know what I'm gonna say. Hayden Christensen, ugh. I find people are generally of two minds when it comes to Hayden Christensen. There is the mindset that it's really George Lucas to blame and that he's not that bad and he had poor direction. The other mindset is that, nah, he just sucks. Although it's also been speculated that his acting translated the way it did because he was attempting to recreate the voice patterns of James Earl Jones, who of course voices Darth Vader. I tend to think it's a mixture of both. His performance is very wooden in this movie. He does improve in Revenge of the Sith in his delivery of what are mainly bad lines in this film. It makes them come off even worse than they might have had they been delivered by somebody with more skill or more experience. For me, I think it was probably a mix of he was trying to fulfill what he thought Earl Jones sounded like, or he was trying to fulfill what Lucas thought Earl Jones or Vader should sound like, coupled with a lack of experience, and I think it just translated as a very poor performance from him. And I love Padme. You guys have heard me say over and over that she is a great female character 
particularly in The Phantom Menace. Not so much in this one, even less in Revenge of the Sith, but she's somebody that I looked up to when I was young. I absolutely loved Padme, but her character is back and forth in this, and I think that Portman made the most of her performance that she possibly could, given the lines. And it's probably because of her character, the way it was written, her character going back and forth, that the performance didn't come across as great. But I don't think that this was her strongest acting performance. Maybe she just saw her lines and was like, seriously, and did her best. That's just speculation. But I thought that she did not do as well in this one as she has done in other films and as she did in The Phantom Menace. And I mean, come on, Ewan McGregor shines as Obi-Wan, of course. I don't think they could have cast him better. I've said that before. I strongly believe it. Ian McDermott is so subtly sinister as Palpatine and alternately Sidious when he slips into the Sidious side of his personality, like when that mask falls, that you can tell he truly became the character. His performance is so impressive in this movie and I wish people talked about it more. He does such a great job as Palpatine and Sidious. Honestly, I think you might be able to argue that he's the best actor in the prequels. I th I think that it's arguable. And of course, you gotta love Samuel L. Jackson as Mace. I mean, he is Mace. He wanted to be in the movie. They created the character for him. I also want to specifically mention how well Christopher Lee did as Dooku in this movie, and I didn't appreciate that until I read the novelization of the film. I don't think he gets enough credit for it because, I mean, Christopher Lee in real life was a badass dude. If you don't know anything about the history of Christopher Lee, do yourself a favor, go look up information on him. He was like a James Bond type secret service agent. He was in a metal rock band in his 80s. Like, Christopher Lee was a dude of epic proportions. He was awesome. Now, I think he did such a good job as Dooku because when you read more about Dooku's character, you realize that Dooku was a straight up, by the book definition, sociopath. No emotion, nothing. And then when you realize that Dooku is a sociopath and you watch Christopher Lee's performance as Dooku, you see that he has portrayed that very, very well. It's not something that I ever caught before I knew that Dooku was a sociopath. Having caught it, I was able to see the implementation of those traits in Christopher Lee's delivery of the character, and I was like, oh my god, this performance is fantastic. The music, for the most part, in this movie, unlike the recent movies, was good. The exception being, I felt that the Geno's in Factory fight scene music just didn't quite fit. But I mean, this, this film's music is definitely not as good as the Phantom Menace score, but I mean, let's face it, it's kind of hard to top the score for that movie because the music in the Phantom Menace is just like, it's just second to none. Despite having good action sequences and you get to see, you know, you know, more threads are coming together, the groundwork is getting laid for the third movie. When you reach for a phone almost constantly while you're watching something and you're just wishing that it would end and you're rolling your eyes and cringing through a lot of it, especially when you're cringing and rolling your eyes through a primary development of a relationship that's going to deeply impact the entire future of Vader and the fall of the Republic and something that's so pivotal to the storyline. When you can't wait for that to end, there's a problem with the entertainment value. That factors in heavily to my movie rating scale. It was hard for me to even summon up the willpower to finish writing this review because this middle movie is so relatively mediocre to The Phantom Menace and to Revenge of the Sith that I had a hard time summoning up any kind of passion, whether it was good or bad, to talk about it at all. Which is not a fun thing to say about a movie, but there it is. On my movie rating scale, Attack of the Clones gets a 55%. Fairly pretty much in the middle. That is the lowest ranked Star Wars film for me, aside from The Last Jedi. Again, I'm not talking about the Christmas special. Even Solo beats out this movie on the rating scale for me because of so many defects in the entertainment value and in the storyline and in the acting. Something I am curious about, I've never heard anyone actually express that they really and truly like this movie out of all the Star Wars movies. I don't think I have ever heard anyone say like, oh yeah, Attack of the Clones, I really like that one because of X, Y, and Z. So I'm, I am genuinely curious. 
do you, do any of you guys actually like this movie? Well and truly like this movie? Even enough to call it your favorite? I'm just, I'm very curious. I genuinely want to know if this is anyone's favorite Star Wars film because I'm thinking about it. And I don't know anyone who actually really likes this movie. I know people that love Revenge of the Sith. I know people that love The Phantom Menace. I don't know anybody that really cares about Attack of the Clones. So, I mean, if that's you, please tell me. Poor Attack of the Clones. Oh my god, poor Attack of the Clones. Anyway, I hope you guys are having an awesome week so far. Please feel free if you haven't subscribed yet. Hit the button, ring a bell if you choose. I think we'll be moving forward to Revenge of the Sith. And in the meantime, I'll catch you later.